Wendell Berry has said that the world cannot be discovered by a journey of miles, no matter how long, but only by a spiritual journey, a journey of one inch, very arduous and humbling and joyful, by which we arrive at the ground at our own feet and learn to be at home. Let us take a spiritual journey together this year, a pilgrimage of learning to be at home. Together we will leave the safety and comfort of the familiar and test our mettle in an arduous and humbling and joyful journey. It will be difficult at times, but we'll face the unfamiliar together. There will be times of grieving to release what we've lost and times of celebration to renew our resolve. Through it all, we will learn together to widen our horizons, deepen our hearts, and release our limitations so that we might know each other and ourselves anew. Good morning. We ring our peace bowl today for our shared pilgrimage, for our vision and our hope for peace. Let us remember as we begin the traditional names of the four groups that make up the Yavapai we know today. The Wipukepas, the Tokepayas, the Kwevkapayas, and the Yavape. This is the land they loved long before we arrived. Let us pray for this nation, for safety for all during this next week, and for peace on earth, not a superficial peace, but peace grounded in justice. The kind of peace that Dr. King gave his life for, the journey was hard and long and uncomfortable and music lifted all those who walked with him towards freedom. Oh, freedom, let us sing that song. Oh, freedom. Good morning and welcome to Granite Peak. Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Prescott, Arizona. I'm Marianne Erickson, Stewardship Chair and your Worship Associate today. We extend a warm welcome to all of you as you look forward to the virtual celebration honoring the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. tomorrow. We're really glad you're able to join us today and we hope you're happy and in good health we want to stay connected, so please join us for the breakout rooms after the service. This will give us time to chat with members, friends, and visitors in small groups. If you are joining us for the first time, please visit our website for more information about Granite Peak Unitarian Universalist Congregation at prescottuu.org. This is the mission statement of our congregation. We are a compassionate, spiritual community that celebrates diversity, nurtures the personal and spiritual growth of all ages, shares our gifts, promotes justice for all, and serves the world we live in. We extend our thanks to all who contributed to the presentation of our service today, Reverend Patty Willis, Heather Knowles for technical direction, Mary Lou Prince for musical direction and in appreciation for our hardworking, wonderful choir. These are today's announcements. Although we are physically apart, we are still in community and we continue with some of our meetings and activities via the internet. So please continue to check the weekly peak emailed newsletter and our website and Facebook page for announcements and to join our special and regular weekly Zoom meetings. In the weekly peak emailed newsletter on Wednesdays, you will find a link to the Granite Peak Leadership YouTube channel for videos of past services, Patty's messages and Granite Peak music. We encourage you on Wednesdays, other than this Wednesday, to join the Granite Peak Politics and Religion Forum at 10 a.m. 
This week, the forum will not meet because of the inauguration that occurs on Wednesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Don't miss Friday lunch with Reverend Patty Willis at noon on Zoom. You will find connection information and other announcements in the order of service today and in the Wednesday weekly emailed newsletter. Bev Bostrom, Granite Peaks Faith Development Coordinator reports that the younger children are in their Zoom meeting right now. The older kids will be meeting at 1130. Both groups will be talking about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and preparing for their day of service on Monday. Please contact Bev at bevbostrom at macmac.com for Zoom links. 3 p.m. Sunday gatherings in the Granite Peak parking lot are on hiatus until it feels to gather there. Please remember our, our at-risk members and friends during joys and concerns and otherwise other times and contact Nancy Beeson if you are in need of any help from the caring team. Due to the technical limitations on Zoom in the hinterland here where I live and John lives, the, the Introduction to Buddhism series has been postponed until the sessions can be held in person at Granite Peak. Save the date for our Saturday, March 6th annual stewardship gathering that will follow on Zoom after we each eat a meal provided by Granite Peak for us to enjoy in our own home. The Stewardship Committee is busy planning this special night. Watch this space for more news about Saturday, March the 6th. This chalice lighting comes to us from Reverend Kathleen. Oh, you know what? I'm out of turn. I think it's Reverend Patty's turn. It is your turn, Marianne. Go ahead with the chalice lighting. You're muted. Please pardon my confusion. This chalice lighting comes to us from Reverend Kathleen Rowlands of Charlottesville, Virginia. Spirit of justice, who befriends those who stand upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone. We are grateful to be together this morning. We gather especially to remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but not only him for there were thousands of unnamed women and men who put their bodies and lives on the line so that all may be free. And yet freedom comes at a cost. And we know that racism and homophobia, ageism and ableism, sexism and classism, all of these often unacknowledged realities prevent us from fully knowing one another, from creating the beloved community spoken of by prophets and ordinary persons alike. May the work of Dr. Martin Luther King continue to eradicate injustice against wherever and whenever we encounter it. May we continue to speak out against injustice, to speak even if we are afraid, our words will not be heard or welcomed. May the spirit of Dr. King continue to flow through our daily living May we have the courage of Dr. King as we continue to stand up for the justice, for justice, reconciliation, and truth, despite challenge and controversy. Dr. King went to the mountaintop. He saw the promised land, and he reassured us we will get there one day. May that be no paradisal dream, but a reality in our own time. May it be so.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Marianne, for that beautiful chalice lighting. Here in Prescott today, we have our own mountaintop to climb. And I hope that that makes some of you really happy because I know that you are people who go down into the Grand Canyon and back up and up that Thumb Butte, how many times I've heard those stories. So I hope that that is good news because we've got some climbing ahead of us. Yesterday, I woke up to an email from Tracy Augustine, who is a new presence in our community. It contained an announcement from the United Church of Christ about the possibility of violence against liberal churches from the 17th to the 20th, which is Wednesday. Immediately, I forwarded that announcement to Elaine Hayes, our board president, and our vice president, Bobby Bollinger, and Suki Jones and Udell Stuckey because they're involved also in our neighborhood outreach. And I was thinking about if we closed our building, we'd have people coming and um, who needed food. But together, it seemed like it was important to, be, to close our building. So at 2 p.m., um, but in between that time, Mary Lou and I had to have a conversation because um, the choir was going to gather in just a couple of hours at our, um, at our parking lot. And we just thought that we needed to choose safety. Um, and so she telephoned everyone and um, BJ went to the parking lot for any of those who didn't get the message. And also during that time, I am blessed with having a relationship now with, um, with our Prescott Police Chief Black. And I sent her, a, a, texted her a message about what we were concerned about and, um, and she looked up what they knew about um, what was going on and responded very quickly. An officer called me and said that although they had heard um, some of the things that, um, that I had heard, that there was nothing specifically in this county and that they would be on the watch and that they would let us know and especially um, think of the, the churches and, um, and be a presence. And at, around this time, all this happened kind of at once. Around this time, the UUA sent a message and they said that the FBI had um, news that um, liberal churches might be targeted this weekend um, in Arizona and Montana. So that is why um, the decision was made to close the church just through Wednesday. Um, it's it, these times I'm always thinking, are we acting out of fear or um, for concern for safety? And when Heather and I um, and Lou and I went to the church to take just the part of the computer that has the database in it out to her place because of you know, the, the possibility of vandalism, um, we all felt more like the smart three little pigs <laughs> than that we were uh, <laughs> afraid of the wolf. And we have a nice brick building. And boy, did that building seem strong when we were there. And we are looking forward to being back there. But I wanted to give you um, uh, a scene of, of what um, happened yesterday, that these decisions are not fear-based, they are safety-based. And throughout the civil rights movement that we are celebrating today, leadership had to make such choices. When was it worth the risk and when was it not? We see this all through Dr. King's writings. Together, we will know, your leadership will know 
when we come to a time when we have to make such choices. And we will keep you posted along the way. And I will be in the waiting in the main room after this service if you have any questions about these things. Because just like Prescott has shown itself not to be welcoming to everyone. And that's the work I believe that we must do. Our national anthem, written during a time of enslavement, does not resonate for African Americans. So today we're going to sing the national anthem that was written and chosen by African Americans because it opens our anthem to all people. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our fathers sighed. We have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast. Let us march on in Prescott too till victory is won. Let us sing together, lift every voice and sing. I could hear you out there singing. Now, please join me in, our, in saying our covenant together. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest for truth, its sacrament and service is its prayer to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve others in community, thus do we covenant together. Today, we have the pleasure to hear from Bev Bostrom, who has been guiding our faith development ship for the last nine months through COVID, 10 months through COVID. But before we hear from her, I want to show you a photograph of the beginnings of part of a big dream to connect with families in our neighborhood. Dan Reardon made this wonderful children's library and installed it yesterday in front of our faith development building. After you get a good look at that library, which is going to be filled with children's books and supplies soon, let us listen to Bev Bostrom, our faith development coordinator. So cute. Hi, and good morning. I'm Bev Bostrom, and I am the coordinator of faith development at Granite Peak. I've been involved with Granite Peak for, oh, probably close to 10 years, and I'm so glad that I found our congregation. With my work with the faith development, I basically work with the children and youth. And some of the projects that we've been able to do, thanks to the wonderful contributions of our congregates, we've been able to maintain a community garden. Plus, I was able to maintain our programs throughout the COVID problems. I'm able to get materials and take them to the children's homes so that we can continue our education program. As we join together and share our gifts through our stewardship program this year, we're gonna be able to continue our mission of serving our congregation in our beloved community. Isn't that an amazing library? <laughs> if you have some extra children's books, please bring them by on um, from Thursday when we're open again, or, or you could just even go and put them in that sweet little house. Let us listen again as our peace bowl becomes this sound where I want you to 
let's breathe together and think of all the joys and sorrows that are gathered in our community. Let us breathe together and let us consider all those joys and sorrows. Let us join our hearts together. As we enter this time of meditation, let us feel that connection that we are feeling, that I have heard from you, that you are feeling with our greater community and with this nation and with this world. As I ring the bell again, I will invite you to say the names of those who you are holding in your hearts. Today, especially, we hold with joy Sue, the daughter of Anna Bess and Jim Robinson, who is recovering beautifully now. And let us continue to hold Dick Fox, Eunice Lovejoy and Janer Aldridge, who are now in, under palliative care. Let us hold Karen Anderson as she continues to recover from that awful accident. Let us hold Eric Jarnigan, who is also still recovering. And our Native American flute player, Sue Daniels. Her mother, Catherine Brewer, passed away on January 7th. She was in hospice at Las Fuentes for five days, and Sue and her sister were able to stay with her and play that beautiful flute to her. Let us also hold Gabby Giffords, who was injured 10 years ago this month in Tucson. She was our Congresswoman at that time. Six others died, many were injured. Let us hold this nation. Let us hold Chief Black, the law enforcement officers of Prescott, of Yavapai County, all over this country. And now after I ring the bell, I invite you to say the names of those who are on your hearts, and then we will enter into about a minute of meditation. All the families who have lost someone from COVID. Please join me in a spirit of meditation and prayer. Spirit of life, spirit of peace, spirit of freedom. We hold 
in the arms of this community, our nation. We hold this nation during this week when there will be a transfer of power. We ask for, for safety, but we ask for safety grounded in justice. We also feel strongly this pandemic that is around us that has touched more and more of our lives, of family, of friends. We hold the families of the one and friends of the 1.8 million people around this world who have died from this virus. We hold the scientists who are finding better and better ways to prevent this from happening. We ask for vaccinations to come to those who need them most. We ask for wisdom in the leadership of this city, of this county, of this state, of this nation. We ask for all those things that are quiet in our hearts, that we would be hearing if we had a microphone and were in our sanctuary. Especially, we ask for comfort for those who are alone in this time, that they may reach out, that they know that within this community there are people who would love to hear from them, who would love to bring them a meal, who would love to meet them at a distance. We give thanks for the pets who have held us and for the friends who have written to us and called us. For all these things, we give thanks, amen. And now let us sing together this pilgrimage we are walking. Maybe we should say we are hiking, <laughs> we are climbing, but let us say, let us um, sing those words together. the time in our service when we normally gather the offering in the sanctuary. Let us embrace the feeling of connection and community that we have when we gather each week. Let us remember that this congregation, its staff, and its programs are supported by your generosity. We also give back to the greater community through our seeds of support SOS program. During the month of January, our congregation will support Prescott Area Shelter Services, known as PASS, P-A-S-S, whose mission is to serve women, children, and veterans by providing temporary housing, resources, individualized case management, and a pathway to permanent housing. Other programs of PASS are education, uh, to employability, wheels to work, and the Smile with Confidence dental care program. To give during this distance time, please go to prescottuu.org. On the bottom left hand side, click the word donate to contribute via PayPal. The link is also available in the chat on this video. Please note in the comment box or memo line, uh, if you mail a check, if your funds are for your pledge, seeds of support, or a donation to Granite Peak. What is given in love is received in gratitude. Blessed be. 
And now we will enjoy the recording of A Change is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. I love those memories that brings up in um, the good things that the news has brought us in the past many years. In 1963, looking back on the Montgomery bus boycott, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, one of the most dedicated participants of the bus protest in Montgomery, Alabama was an elderly woman whom we affectionately called Mother Pollard. Although poverty stricken and uneducated, she was amazingly intelligent and possessed a deep understanding of the meaning of the movement. After having walked for several weeks, she was asked if she were tired with profundity, she answered, my feet is tired, but my soul is rested. And on a particular Monday evening during that time, following a tension packed week, which included being arrested and receiving numerous threatening telephone calls, I spoke at a mass meeting. I attempted to convey an overt impression of strength and courage, although I was inwardly depressed and fear-stricken. At the end of the meeting, Mother Pollard came to the front of the church and said, come here, son. I immediately went to her and hugged her affectionately. Wouldn't that be amazing? Hugging? Wow. <laughs> she said, something is wrong with you. You didn't talk strong tonight. Seeking further to disguise my fears, I retorted, oh no, Mother Pollard, nothing is wrong. I am feeling as fine as ever. But her insight was discerning. Now you can't fool me, she said. I know something is wrong. Is, is it that, you, that we ain't doing the things to please you? Or is it that the white folks is bothering you? Before I could respond, she looked directly into my eyes and said, I done told you we is with you all the way. Then her face became radiant and she said in words of quiet certainty, but even if we ain't with you, God's gonna take care of you. And as she spoke those consoling words, everything in me quivered and quickened with the pulsing tremor of raw energy. And since that dreary night in 1956, Mother Pollard has passed on to glory, and I have known very few quiet days. I have been tortured without and, to and tormented within by the raging fires of tribulation. I have been forced to muster what strength and courage I have to withstand howling winds of pain and jostling storms of adversity. But as the years have unfolded, the eloquently simple words of Mother Pollard have come back again and again to give light and peace and guidance to my troubled soul. God's gonna take care of you. This faith transforms the whirlwind of despair into a warm and reviving breeze of hope. Let us look at that Montgomery bus boycott. In Montgomery, Alabama, a people looked at how they were being impacted negatively by their society and they assumed responsibility for change. Joanne Robinson was an English professor at Alabama State University, and she headed up an organization called the Women's Political Council. Joanne Robinson had an episode on the Montgomery bus where she is accosted by a bus driver, and she leaves the bus you know, in terror. Um, she thought the bus driver was, gonna, was going to hit her as he demanded she sit in a black-only section in an almost empty bus. When she talked to other women in the Women's Political Council about this episode, she found out that they had similar experiences. There were a number of arrests in 1955 of black women who were violating the segregation ordinance on the buses. 
And on the night of December 1st, when Rosa Parks is arrested, Joanne Robinson springs into action, and they actually execute this plan to, to initiate a bus boycott. At the time, most people rode the bus to kind of get around. There weren't as many cars on the road. So you begin to realize that if we don't ride the buses, you know, we are able to kind of break the system to a great degree. Joanne Robinson comes on campus late that night with a couple of students, runs off 50,000 flyers. The next morning, between classes, they pass out these flyers. She calls a civil rights attorney, Fred Gray. She calls E.D. Nixon, labor organizer, really the recognized leader of Black Montgomery. And they decide to endorse the boycott. They organize the Montgomery Improvement Association to execute and to coordinate the activities surrounding the Montgomery bus boycott. And they select this newcomer, Martin Luther King, to head up the Montgomery Improvement Association. Martin Luther King weaves into Montgomery ideas about love and civil disobedience, overcoming adversity. And the people of Montgomery were willing not only to listen, but to act on this. I was the NAACP Youth Council president, and I participated in the boycott. I walked to school, and we just saw the empty buses go by because there were no black people on them. At the time that this movement began here, we had about 50,000 African Americans living in Montgomery, and they were pretty close to 50,000 black people who worked together during this bus boycott. We stayed off the buses and found other ways to get to where we needed to go. So they bought station wagons, and they had an actual route, just like buses have routes. For several weeks, I was a volunteer driver every day going out and just hauling people to work or to school. So people just didn't walk. They rode, but they rode in a system that they created. 382 days. That's a long time. Can you imagine how empowered people felt? It's like, we did what? The Montgomery bus boycott says to the nation that segregation is no longer the law of the land and that the formula for attacking segregation in all of its facets is going to be nonviolent civil disobedience on one hand and litigation on the other. The boycott was one of the greatest examples of civic engagement of the 20th century. In that reading, Reverend King writes of standing up in front of a tired group of people in Montgomery, and they were only weeks into a bus boycott that was going to go for longer than a year. He was afraid, and he was feeling inwardly depressed and fearful, and he wanted to spread strength and courage Mother Pollard knew that something was wrong. And you know, that's something I love about being a minister. I can't tell you something that I don't mean or feel because that wouldn't feel right to me in the first place. And I think you'd probably guess it anyway. Being your minister forces me to practice what I preach. I have to walk with you. Yesterday, we closed our building for the next four days. The three little pigs avoiding the wolf, waiting until we know that the danger of vandalism is over. And to tell you the truth, it kind of tickles me that white supremacist groups find that we are a threat. We are a danger to their beliefs. We hold that possibility that this nation could become a place of fairness for all people, that Prescott could become everyone's hometown. What a dangerous thought. On September 4th in Prescott this year, no, it's last year now, <laughs> and January 6th in Washington, D.C., what we saw with armed militias 
was the tip of the iceberg. Yesterday, when I read the email from the United Church of Christ and from our UUA, that liberal churches might be targeted during the next four days, I was seeing another tip of an iceberg, feeling just a bit of that fear that that kind of group uses as a weapon, for they are groups of terrorism. For African Americans and people of color, these events are not a surprise. They affirm their experience with the rest of that iceberg. Have you ever seen a picture of an iceberg? You just see a little tiny bit on the top, but under is this huge, huge piece of ice. For people of color, this is all one piece that what we saw at the Capitol, the lynchings, the rapes, the Jim Crow laws, like the ones that Rosa Parks broke when she wouldn't go back on that bus. She wouldn't go to the back of that bus. The brutality that led to the deaths of George Floyd, Michael Brown, Ahmed Arbery, Tamir Rice, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, Tony McDade, the list keeps growing. And in order to try to understand not just what is happening, but a perspective on what is happening, we have been reading Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, Isabel Wilkerson's Cast, and starting soon, Breathe, A Letter to My Sons by Imani Perry. It's a beautiful book of poetry, and it is hard to read. This reading has been hard work. These are not easy books to read and digest if we read them with our minds and hearts open. Some books are full of theory, and all of them, especially Breathe, brings us into lived experience that we would not know otherwise. Through these books, we learn how to build compassion that will take us through, that will take us up this mountain. I know that before I arrived, you read books recommended by the Unitarian Universalist Association to understand racism and its role in our lives and the way that it lives inside us. In this difficult work, we can feel the impossibility of any change happening. We can be discouraged as Martin Luther King Jr. felt during his ministry over and over again, as he did on that day when Mother Pollard told him to let God take care of him. In December of 1955, Rosa Parks stayed in a seat at the front of a bus and she was arrested. I want you to imagine if you have ridden buses that every time you entered, you knew that you would have to go to the back, even if there was no one in the front of the bus. And often you were also treated with disdain by bus drivers. There are so many stories of bus, buses going right up to a bus stop and when there were only African-Americans driving past. These times when people felt publicly disrespected, connected with their knowledge of lynching and rape, the tools of terrorism that had been rampant for the 90 years after the Civil War, to rob people of that sense of security and spread fear as terrorism does. Fear that even a small infringement, like looking someone straight in the eyes, asking for what one wanted, any of that could lead to punishment as serious as rape or death. During this time, December of 1955, when Rosa Parks' courage was a catalyst for a movement, a well-planned movement, 
I was in my mother's womb, waiting to be born. My mother was taking care of a one-year-old brother. I believe she was trying to make sure he was potty trained before I was born in six more months. Soon she would have a newborn to take care of as well. She and my father and brother were living in Champaign, Illinois, where my father was getting his doctorate in geology, paid for by the GI Bill. They were living poor, searching under sofa cushions for change in order to buy tickets to go to a movie. The GI Bill for World War II veterans like my father promised help with buying homes, becoming educated, made the life that my siblings and I enjoyed possible. The PhD opened the doors for my father to be the chief geologist of an oil company in South America and then North Africa and the Persian Gulf, changing the lives of his children, making us citizens of the world. His education and career, my father's embodiment of living the life that he dreamed gave us a sense of possibility that life could be a great adventure. Do you know that over a million African-American veterans were blocked from this pivotal opportunity? The way that the GI Bill is structured is an example of white supremacy that led to white privilege the privilege that is intrinsic to my life. I'd like for you to think for a moment of the situation of your own family at this time, 1956. What were they doing? What were their struggles? Did you inherit any privileges from that time? If we return to that bus boycott, I imagine that there were World War II veterans walking to work, work that would have been higher paid if they had had that GI Bill opportunity that my father was taking advantage of. While I was growing within my mother, people were walking to work in an act of resistance to the oppression of the bus system. And their resistance was working. The bus system of Montgomery, Alabama was suffering economically. That bus system depended on the African-Americans whom they were sending to the back of the bus. But it took a few months to know that they were winning that battle. In the reading, Martin Luther King Jr. is looking back at that time when people were feeling discouraged, when they thought that Montgomery would never change. Some of you have said to me, Prescott is never going to change. Someone actually said to me, I hope you know Prescott isn't going to change, that it's a waste of your time. And I know that you are speaking out of your experience. For some of you, you have spent decades here in this place. Granite Peak has been a beacon of justice many times. And this week, when I went back to my office, I've really enjoyed spending those morning hours and greeting people to give them food. I saw a pamphlet that was made about the Women's March at the time of another inauguration four years ago. Those photographs taken in the midst of a time of great disappointment. This march was a lifeline of hope in this place. So many people showed up and marched and there was no armed resistance or there wasn't any in the pictures that I saw. Looking back, those of you who are there, I invite you to keep that feeling for that is also the feeling that we can have here in Yavapai County. As recent as June of this past year, 
we had a beautiful gathering for Black Lives Matter at the Courthouse Square, co-organized by Anna Fleury. Perhaps we need to learn a way of doing things here that works. And as we can learn from Montgomery, sometimes the road becomes really rocky before there is any big change. The past four years have been a struggle. People have been more open about racism. Before I went to meet with the mayor and other clergy, I asked leaders to tell me about the situation of immigrant families and individuals, LGBTQI plus people, people who identify as people of color, all our neighbors. And what I heard is that in the past four years, there has been a shift towards very bad behavior. There has been a shift during the past four years and it has been more intensely felt during the past year. I've heard that people speaking Spanish to each other have experienced not only dirty looks and threatening gestures, People have walked behind them, followed them to their cars, and told them to go home. For those of you who studied about racism 10 years ago or two years ago, I wish I could tell you that you don't need to read anymore. I wish I could tell you that you were done, that racism was a thing of the past, but it is not. It is not. And in the midst of all these areas of life in this country that have become worse in this than the past four years, I believe that there is hope. Hope for this city, the Quad Cities, this county, and this country. We have a great opportunity, I believe, in this project that has begun at our building with leadership shared with Udell Stuckey. Thank you, Udell. We are calling this our Neighborhood Outreach Ministry. This ministry encompasses the non-perishable food pantry for immigrant individuals and families, our beautiful children's free library made by Dan Reardon, and the beginnings of connections with veterans who live in the housing across the street. I had a wonderful conversation with the man who works over there, who helps to connect veterans with opportunities. And right now, what we have together is this week, after last week and the week before. And I have a neighbor who said, this election isn't over yet. Just wait till Wednesday. I didn't pursue a conversation. After the images of January 6th at our nation's capital became imprinted in my mind, I wondered while I was driving in Prescott, when I saw other people driving, walking, shopping, I wondered in my mind, did you support? Do you support this insurrection? Do you actually believe that the election was stolen? And these questions have inspired Lou and me to go to the courthouse plaza and make intentions. Our first one, which we put on Facebook, was to feel that we belonged in that square, that we belong here, that this is our hometown. All of us, unless we move, and I hope that no more of you do move, all of us are in this for the long haul. And we're in it for the long haul with each other and with those pesky humans who live around us. That man who said what he did on our walk. And I'm going to keep trying. For me to be here for the long haul, I need to be connected with this transformation. 
Don't worry about my getting tired establishing relationships with our neighbors. That is what gives ministry meaning to me. I feel refreshed, like Mother Pollard said. Her feet were tired, but her spirit was happy. I feel refreshed when I see our welcome increase. I wish that I could express to you how good it feels that a single mother with three children who's living in a room of a home who lost her job because a restaurant closed is now stocked up with food. And you, you can help broaden our welcome as some of you are by studying Spanish and Spanish language literature and Latin American history and the injustice of our country's history of immigration. I've also been getting to know some neighbors who might be using our free children's library. Our children are going to be stocking it up as a service project. And Udell and I spent a sparkly afternoon last week dreaming up possibilities of having board games available for veterans in our social hall once a week. I hope some of you will want to play with them. And together, we can study that book, Breathe, A Letter to My Sons. You can study that with me beginning on January 27th. There is much for us to overcome within us and without us until we are one with this world and until there is justice in our neighborhoods. Amen. And may it be so. And I wish I could hear you all because I'd ask you, are you with me? Okay, thank you. I can hear some voices. Thank you. And now I want you to hear Pete Seeger and sing with him. He is in Berlin. It is 1967, and there was a wall stretching through that city that would not go down for decades. And he sang, We Shall Overcome. Let us sing together. Let us all say together as our closing words, We are not afraid. Please say that with me. We are not afraid. We are not afraid. The world has been looking at this country since our beginnings that, that spoke of freedom. And the world is looking at us right now. The Japanese are looking at us. The Germans are looking at us. Everyone is wondering if we can live up to who we are. And what we do in this small place makes all the difference. Are you with me? So we must keep our eyes on the prize. I am grateful for this day that reminds us of a great man and his work. And I hear so many times people who are many African Americans are tired of our talking about him because there are so many others and we focus on him who is not the only or the last black person who has changed the world, but he is one of them. W.E.B. Du Bois, another black man who changed the world in his last message to the world in 1957, he was 89 years old. It was one year after the Montgomery bus boycott, he wrote, Believe in life. Always human beings will progress to great, broader, and fuller life. W.E.B. Du Bois 
was in this world, in this nation for the long haul. Let's be here in Prescott and in this nation for the long haul. Let us work together, learn from the good and difficult times of the past. Dream big for the future. Open our doors to our neighbors. Let's keep our eyes on the prize. Amen, and may it be so. And let us sing, keep your eyes on the prize, a song that fueled the civil rights movement. Now we will extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now I invite you either to stay in the main room if you'd like to continue this conversation or I invite you to go into a breakout room. But I have to warn you, I have a chalice circle at 12. So um, you've got until 12 to talk and then you can get on your phones and talk, but, um, but we need to use the Zoom for our chalice circle. So do what you need to do with the breakout rooms. <laughs> <laughs>